We're looking at problem 56 from chapter 10 on page 560. This one is talking about uh, the mean internet use by Canadian internet users. So I'm dealing with means, so it's going to be the, tr mu is going to be the true mean uh, internet usage, I guess, in hours by Canadians. Canadians, yes. Okay. And then we're going to need a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. So here comes my null hypothesis, if I can paste it in. So my null hypothesis is going to be that it's, let's see, 12.5 hours of Internet use, because they're claiming to see if it's greater than 12.5, so the null hypothesis is always an equal to. The alternate is a greater than 12.5, and this is a one-sided test because it's a greater than question so far. Uh, what I need to do is I need to look at a hypothesis test. Uh, so I'm looking for a test for means, so I need to see if I have a simple random sample. And it does say that uh, it's given that I have a random sample of Canadian, Canadian uh, internet users. So that is given. I, it also given my sample size is large, so I can say since my sample is sufficiently large uh, because um, n equals, let's see, what was it, a thousand? Yes. Is definitely greater than 30. I'm going to get all that on one line, I guess. Um, that means the central limit theorem uh, states that the sampling distribution of the sample mean is uh, approximately normal. But since I don't know uh, the population Standard deviation. I'm going to use a T distribution. And now the point is here, you cannot argue that the central limit theorem says the sample distribution is approximately normal and then act like you're using the sampling distribution because technically you're not using the sample distribution of X bar because that would require you to know sigma. You're using a t-distribution that is an approximation of the sampling distribution of x bar. So we need to name the test I'm going to use. So what I'm going to be using is a one sample t-test. I only have one sample, so tell you what you're testing. The test I'm using is a t-distribution, so t-test for a population mean. Always say what our statistic is for. Now it's time to start listing test statistics. So, my sample size in this case was 1,000, which is huge. My degrees of freedom then is 999, not that that's going to make much of a difference. A one sample t-test is going to be x bar is 12.7. Uh, sample standard deviation, it says they didn't actually report it, but we're going to assume that it was 5 hours. And then the significance level is, they give us is 0 0.05, and remember, alpha, my significance level, is the probability of making a type 1 error. So I'm basically deciding from the set out of this problem that I'm willing to take a 5% chance of uh, rejecting the null hypothesis when I really should. Now, once all that's set, it's time to go ahead and go on with our test. Looking for the probability that x bar is bigger than 12.7. Uh, since it was a one-tailed test, I was looking for a greater than, so I need to change that to a t-score. The way I change it to a t-score is I use my statistic, which is 12.7, subtract my hypothesized value, which is 12.5, and divide by the standard deviation of the statistic, which is, in this case, 5 over the square root of sample size, which is square root of 1,000. Okay, once I get this t-score, I need to go over to the calculator to get it, I guess. So I'm going to have a 0.2 is going to be my numerator, and that's going to be divided by 5 divided by square root of 1,000. A lot of times I put that denominator in separately, but I broke my own rule this time. Oops, my calculator really likes zeros. And that's going to be... <laughs> Error, 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 error
12 point six uh, five. There it is. Now, once we have this, I'm looking for the probability of having a t-score that high, so I need to go to distribution. Um, uh, that's going to be a TCDF because I have a test statistic and I'm trying to get a p-value. So I'm going to start there, I'm going to go to there, I'm going to do 999 degrees of freedom, I'm going to paste it. And that's going to give me a value of 0 0.1031. That is my p-value. That means if I were to sketch a distribution, I would be looking at the probability that I would be more than one standard deviation above the mean, which would be basically about there. So that is what I'm getting as my 12%, uh, I mean my roughly 10% there. So the p-value is the probability of having a result this far off if your null hypothesis is correct. So if my null hypothesis is really 12.5, um, I have a, roughly a 10% chance of being 12.7 or higher. My p-value of 0 0.1031 is gr uh, not less than my alpha of 0 0.05. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. Oh, it is a fail to reject. Be careful. Fail to reject my null hypothesis because it was not less than alpha. I failed to reject. And that means I'm going to say there is no statistically significant evidence that the um, true I uh, mean, internet usage by Canadians is over 12.5 hours. Now, the reason we say we found no statistically significant evidence is we do have some weak evidence that it's greater than 12.5 because we hypothesized 12.5. Our sample said 12.7, which is obviously bigger. But the point is 12.7 isn't enough bigger than 12.5 for us to say, wait, it can't possibly be 12.5. The chance of this happening is so small. Since my p-value is only a 0.1, that means I've got a 1 in 10 chance of randomly getting a sample like this, even if the truth is 12.5. So I'm unwilling to reject my null hypothesis, and that's why I say I find no statistically significant evidence in this case. For part B of this problem, it keeps everything the same except for it changes some of your test statistics. So I'm just going to copy and paste the end of this test, and we're going to go back through it one more time and see what difference that makes. This time, the sample standard deviation, instead of being 5, they're going to assume that the sample standard deviation is only 2. I'm still going to find the p-value by testing that x being greater than 12.5, but this time my denominator is going to change because it's going to be 2 divided by square root of 1,000, and that's going to make a difference probably. When I go to my calculator, I'm going to, I'm going to just highlight my previous thing, pull it up there, go back, and change that 5 to 2. And that's going to give me a much larger t-score. So now my t-score, instead of being just a 1.26 is 3.16 and then I'm going to find a p-value, I'm sorry, a TCDF again. Actually, since that's now my previous answer, I could literally just pull up the one I had and it's going to plug in the 3.16 and that's going to give us a much smaller p-value. So this p-value now is 0 .0008. That E negative 4 will tell you how many zeros are in front of your numbers, including the leading zero in front of your decimal. So if you count the leading zero, there's a total of four zeros in front of that 806. So that is a very small p-value, so I'm going to have to change my conclusion. Since my p-value of 0 0.0008 is less than my alpha of 0 0.5, this time I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. That means there is 
statistically significant evidence that the true mean internet usage by Canadians is over 12.5 hours. I think part of the point of this problem was to demonstrate the effect of the sampling variability on um, getting your um, T-score and your P-value and making your decision. So the amount of variability that's present in the sample, if you have a sample with a lot of variability in it, it's going to have to be very hard to find statistically significant results. If you can find a sample that's a little bit more condensed, it'll be easier.